We're buying hops from like three states. Three states we see. Yeah, uh, Washington, yeah. Uh, Oregon, and Idaho. Okay, now are those three states, and this is for everyone, is that, is that the, like you mentioned, they're like, like they're some of the better? Uh, those are the best hops in the world. Right. Team. So let, let's speak, let's, let's speak <laughs> about it. I like to agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Y'all are brew heads? Yeah, we brew heads. So pour a glass of craft beer. We can do this. Yeah. What's good, y'all? This is C Certified Brewhead. Welcome to episode 101 of Beer Now Chicken Podcast. Uh, this afternoon, we're here in Montreal at a brand new craft beer bar called The Artisanal. So, huge shouts to Don for hosting us. Uh, this place is awesome. It's only opened on Grand Prix weekends. That would have been first weekend of June. Um, super cool. This is an area that's super touristy and doesn't get much beer at all, let alone good beer. So, very, very welcome. And Don was kind enough to host us here today. Um, so we had a really, really interesting podcast, young people. Um, if you guys could just introduce yourselves, let them know just so what your name is and what company you're from, and then we'll. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Luc Beaulieu. I'm the Eastern Canada uh, Regional Sales Manager for uh, Yakima Chief Hops, based in Yakima, Washington. Nice. But I'm living in Montreal. You're based out of here. That's it. Fantastic. My name is Kevin Real. I'm the president and CEO of Double R Hop Ranches, and that's a uh, farm that primarily grows hops, grow a few apples and, and Concord grapes too, but primarily hops in the Yakima Valley of Washington State. Nice. My family's been doing this for generations. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I'm Brock Obendorf. Uh, I'm from Southern Idaho. Uh, we're a third generation hop farm. Uh, we also raise other crops as well, uh, onions, and we have cattle. Uh, we're located by Boise uh, in the Treasure Valley. Oh so. yeah. So as you can tell, we're talking about hops today. So this is super fascinating. So you guys are all in town. We've got like a whole squad of people here today, uh, which is awesome. And you guys are all in town for the Food and Knee Festival tomorrow in Correct. Burnham, yes. yep. which we're all going to. I'm very excited about that. It's going to be crazy. Um, so we have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. We've never done anything like this. So Luke, when you reached out, I was very happy to hear from you because uh, this is something that I've always wanted to get into a little bit more and sort of shed some light. And you guys are the perfect individuals to do so. Um, I feel like we need a beer right now. Sounds good. Yeah, very good. good. Yeah. So you guys have kindly brought the stash of stashes. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> and you've brought some beers that you guys, you are actually your clients. Yeah. You guys purchased the hops that you guys grow. So mm -hmm. very, very fitting. Uh, what did, would you like to start with? I don't know. Let's we'll track to, one. yeah, the Tiffa Noir from uh, Val d'Or Abitibi, I think. Yes. Just American it's pale ale. Yeah, American pale ale. Nice. Uh, they're using uh, one of our three mains brand, uh, Simcoe, Citra, and Mosaic. Okay. This is the name of the beer. It's called Sissimo. First two letters of each. H1. Ah, that's nice. Yeah. So C Simo. I like that. Simcoe, Citra, Mosaic. Is that enough? Yes, but yeah. Is there a company? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to run through a few, so we don't need to go yeah, too Yeah, there's much. a lot. There's a lot to drink. Is there so. a couple of those cans? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Make sure everybody no, gets, there's uh, a lot. gets what they like. Two thirds here. Nice. There you go. We're not going to run out of beer today. I don't think so. You're no, right. I really would be surprised. <laughs> In worst case, there's, uh, there's a bunch of towels oh, downstairs. Well, that's it. We'll pull that out. All right. So while yeah, you're sort of getting the beer together, mm. um, I need a little bit, actually. Yeah. Hey, you want to take some Oh, I'm good. Thank you. Perfect. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for hanging out. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So Simcoe, let's take a look at that can real quick. Yep. I just crushed it. No, it's fine. No problem. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way a natural thing. Hot burn does it, man. We're that's what you do. Last night, sometimes. I finished it. <laughs> yeah, Trefle Noir just started to make some cans like two months or three months ago. So it's pretty. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty, pretty new, right? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, whilst during the podcast, I do this. It started because I do reviews and I had to take stupid photos with the beer to preview drink and I keep going I'm nearly at 4,000 so I'm like OCD so I'm going to keep taking photos during the thing are you guys cool if I oh yeah you no, no problem I thought so most people are pretty cool with it but I'm going to yeah. warn you <laughs> thank you very much yeah. cool alright nice. so while we're uh, sipping the beer um, let's get into your stories like how you got into beer and sort of you know, and then plus in your own individual sort of uh, you know, into the farming or whatever whoever wants to start just yeah how would it happen? Uh, I started to drink craft beer in the 90s. At, when you were 18, legally of age. Mm, <laughs> even younger. No, I was, like in the 90s, I was like 20. So <laughs> I was okay. 
No, I was drinking like more commercial beer. Okay. Uh, but I got into uh, like craft beer beginning of nineties uh, before of Unibrew because of Unibrew. Unibrew, yes. Yeah, uh, Unibrew uh, Blanche de Chambly was my first real, you know, craft beer back then, That's a great beer, and right? uh, it opened a new, brand new world for me. So I was. Uh, you know, drinking a lot of craft beers, attending like beer festival. I remember the first time I went to the uh, beer festival in Montreal was in like, maybe 96 or 95. So a long time ago. And I worked in the media industry for 20, 25 years. And uh, last year I was like pretty tired of it. And I wanted a big change in my life. And my favorite hobby was traveling for beer. Right. So when I saw the job offering at Yakimichi, they were like looking for someone taking care of Eastern Canada, selling hops, and my background is sale for the last 25 years. So wow. I said, okay, maybe it's possible to join my uh, my hobby and work in uh, that for be for the beer industry. Wow. And, uh, applied on the job and it worked. <laughs> so I started January 15, and I'm taking care of uh, big. It's called Eastern Canada, but it's, it's, it's really wide Eastern Canada. It's from Manitoba to Newfoundland. Oh, wow. So, it's, so yeah, it's over 1,000 breweries. So Jeez. a lot of new customers, a lot of exciting uh, people and exciting breweries, as you already know. Yeah. So it's pretty fun to, you know, I'm propagating the good news about our hops <laughs> and our product yeah. are now available in Eastern Canada for everybody. So Fantastic. That's why I'm here. All right. Love it. Yeah. Sick. So I have to back up a long ways, and this is a really interesting place for me to be. It's my first time in Montreal. But nice. actually, my family, both sides of my family uh, are hop growers, and they're all French Canadians. Uh, <laughs> so I speak zero French, but uh, I am, I'm a French Canadian. Uh, that's my Typically, background. Yeah, yeah but uh, particularly on one side of my family, uh, the, the people immigrated, my family immigrated from Canada down to the Yakima Valley, and they started working for uh, a farm in the Yakima Valley that was actually owned out of New York State. Right. Uh, back in the mid-1800s, a lot of the hop production was in New York State, but downy mildew, which is one of the diseases that can affect hops, mm -hmm. uh, really started to affect the production in New York State, and the hot, dry climate of the Yakima Valley, and of course moving west and expansion in the west really attracted people over to the west. So uh, a, a conglomeration of folks from New York State owned a farm in, in Moxie in the Yakima Valley. Uh, incidentally, one of the shareholders was Alexander Graham Bell. Right. And my great grandfather worked uh, for this company called the Moxie Hop Company. And as you know, really as the American dream, uh, where people immigrate and start working in the industry, sooner or later they want to own their own part of it. So uh, my great grandfather started a farm on his own uh, in the Acma Valley, and then my grandfather on my mother's side also had his own hop farm. So I'm a product of these two hop growing families. Um, went off to college, and, and I actually have a degree in technology, and I was going to go to work in the computer industry in the mid 80s, which was a really difficult time in agriculture and, and especially the hop industry. But you know, the draw of growing up and living on a hop farm just pulled me back. Yeah. And uh, so, I, you know, I went to work on the family hop farm, and that's when I really got after college really interested in craft beer and, and in the mid 1980s I mean it was really new and most of it was done with home brewing mm -hmm. and so I started to home brew and I used to do that quite a lot uh, when I was uh, starting my career and I was first married um, I think I have a track record of like the first 15 batches of beer that I made at home on my wife's stove I boiled over every single batch <laughs> uh, trying to capture as much of the aroma as possible into the brew pet kettle so, you know, that really was, you know, growing up on a hop farm, being around hops, and then, you know, home brewing and learning about beer. You, you could put those two things together, and it was really exciting for me because I could see, you know, both the starting to grow the hops and how it finished out into right. the beer. Of course, you know, kids and business and, and life got in the way, and I got to be honest with you, I don't really brew that much anymore, but I understand the process. And, yeah. and so that's important to me. And today, you know, we grow uh, 12 different varieties of hops that uh, go yes. into all different kinds of beer uh, across the world. And it's pretty exciting to meet and work with brewers to do that. So that's my story in a nutshell. Fantastic. Um, I'll probably get into this more detail, but what are the 12 different types of hops? Oh boy. Can you like... Yeah, well, so Cluster, right Cascade, <laughs> Centennial, uh, Amarillo, uh, Sriracha Ace, nice. Citra, um, Sh no, I don't have Chinook. Uh, 682, Zeus, Equinot, Bravo, Eureka, 
probably missing one or two okay, in there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, and you know, we do that as growers because we want to uh, harvest each variety at its optimal time slot. Right. And in order to you know use your production facilities over a 40 day period, you you need this this certain track record of, of varieties that you can pick through and get them at just the exact right time. Mm. Very cool. Thank you, man. Yeah, so I guess uh, our family history is uh, we immigrated over from Germany back in the late 1800s. Uh, we went to Indiana first, and then uh, they put the Boise Project in uh, on our irrigation district. And so my grandfather's uh, dad came over to work on the canal, and they all dug it by hand, and then uh, that's how we got the water. Anyway, so that was, I think, in the 19, early 1900s. And then uh, he got a piece of land, and they started farming there. And then uh, he died when my grandpa was 12 years old, and my grandpa had to take over the farm. And then our neighbors, the Goodings, uh, brought hops over from uh, Oregon, I believe. And then the Bat family, it was Goodings and Bats. And then we were the neighbors, so my grandpa went down there, and he planted, I think, 10 acres of hops. And so that was in 1948. Wow. And so, um, so I'm third generation. Uh, my uh, dad, he started farming hops in the, uh, I believe it was in the early 80s. There was kind of a boom there. Okay. And then uh, now my brother and I uh, pretty much run the farm. Uh, we got 3,000 acres of hops now, 15 different varieties. And uh, we also raise other crops too. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it all happened. And Can you list your 15? Uh, yeah, close? I close. It's Apollo, Bravo. Galena, Super Galena, Chinook, Cascade, Simcoe, Citra, Mosaic, Crystal, El Dorado, um, 682. That's pretty good. You know pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> so let's remember. We just took some Centennial out. That's the one I missed on mine. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I missed uh, the Centennial. Equinot, uh, Cluster. I think that's 14. And I miss Willamette, too. You do Willamette? No, we don't have Willamette. Okay. No. Okay. So that's pretty crazy. This is like one thing that occurred to me now. So what, if, if when your dad was running the farm in the 80s, like, who was that going to? Was it just the big guys? Because there wasn't really many crap. I think it was all the big guys. Right. Yeah, I guess your it must AB, be, right? your Coors. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, but back then, the variety was water wasn't really around or any of those guys. Uh, so I, mean, all the I don't think the, so. They were kind of studying. Yeah. But the varieties back then were clean and clustered. It's yeah, way out, yeah, Orica or just, yeah, just, and a little bit of Cascade, not a, a cascade, lot, but yeah. you know, our yeah. farm at that time, not to jump in front of you here, but I mean, it was a hundred percent cluster, hundred uh-huh. percent cluster for us. I, well, we had a few acres of Cascade. Did but you have was, like L ones and L eights? Yes, we did. So that's, that's two different kind of nuances of the cluster. Oh, that no, I get, get nerdy with it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's fun. laughs> okay. uh, but it was very monolithic uh, at that point in time. And, right. And, Hops were more of a commodity than when, you know, I imagine that your dad would tell you that. Um, back in the 70s and 80s, you know, my hops were the same as his hops. And terroir. We didn't know anything about right. that. I mean, it didn't matter where you planted them, a hop was a hop. And a brewer could do the same thing with everybody's hops. And, and in today's world, it's not that uh, my hops are better than your hops or vice versa, but they're different, right? Yeah. And, you know, you can produce different beers with different characteristics of the hops. And that's so what different exciting. growing regions, you know. I mean, Definitely. there's Idaho, Washington, Oregon. Yep. And I would say Yakima and Southern Idaho are very similar. Mm-hmm. It's very hot and dry. Mm-hmm. I mean, we get nine inches of rain. So. Is that a lot? Excuse my ignorance? No. No. That's pretty dry. No. I mean, I, what, you guys probably get. <laughs> we get seven. And, yes. you know, one of the things that's always been said to me, I think is a really cool thing. So that the hop mm. plant likes to have its feet wet and its head dry. So the top of the plant needs to remain dry. So you want to be in a, a dry desert-like climate, ideally, but you need the water. So, yep. you know, we talked about digging the, the Boise project and that ample irrigation water is crucial, right? right. Yep. So all of the growing regions in the Pacific Northwest really don't rely on rainfall or natural moisture at all. It's all, so it's all irrigated. irrigated agriculture. And so right. we want to control when and how we deliver the irrigation water to the plants. We can't necessarily count on Mother Nature because it, it, it changes our results. Too right. And just to define things, I'm sort of for myself, but also because I don't know much about the farming side of it. Maybe mm-hmm. there's listeners who don't know. So irrigation in, in regards to that, is that like sort of, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Right. So uh, like on our farm, which would be the same up in Yakima, it's all uh, drip irrigation. 
Okay. So mm-hmm. I guess the water is held in the in the reservoir. Okay. Comes out of the reservoir, goes into a canal system. Okay. So your spring runoff from the winter that's all stored there. That comes into your canals. We then take it, pump it out, and then it gets charged into our drip stations. Okay. And then we filter the water and separate the soil out of the water so it's clean enough to go into the drip. Mm-hmm. And then that's when we directly apply it to the to the rows. Right. It's intense. And that's changed a lot over the years. So if we back up again to when Brock's talking about what his dad started farming, you know, what irrigation was then was turning these these big canals of water into small little tiny streams that ran in between the plants and and we wanted the soil to soak up the moisture that way. Yeah. Now with drip irrigation, you, you need to think of it as a sponge. We want the sponge to stay, stay wet and we just put a drop on the top of the sponge every yeah. so often to keep Greater. the sponge yeah. exactly wet. We don't want to put too many drops on it because if you put too many drops on the sponge, it saturates it and the nutrients and things fall out the bottom. We just want to put a drop every once in a while to keep that sponge full but not over full. And you know, in a lot of farms, I imagine Brox is the same. This is all automated. So when you know, when I was a kid and growing up on the farm, uh, changing we call it changing water, irrigating the plants was using a shovel and moving dirt to divert yep. the water. Right. Now it's going up to a controller and changing the settings like a, on the controller to automatically. Sprinkler system ish or something? Is that or is that like a simplified way of thinking about it? like a pipe that like sprays out water or something? Like an I mean, it, in a way, it's kind of like yeah. a sprinkler without the sprinkler heads. Okay. So it's just a controlled dripping out of the pipe. Right, it's so like you just run down all the... Yeah, yeah like the yeah. tubes that you see in landscaping yeah. where they kind of drip out into the plants. That's, that's what we're yeah. picturing. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it's and, and it's very efficient. Mm-hmm. Much right. more efficient than the old, than the old, the old furrow. The old we call it furrow irrigation. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. It's crazy. It's just such stuff, it's some stuff that, like, I'm a city kid, like, very, very city, and I have no clue about any of this stuff. And it's fascinating just to even think about, like, how much work goes into creating it. Mm-hmm. the product and then end up in the pellets. Mm-hmm. Um, we talk about the region. So can you talk, speak to the region? Because I guess the Yakima chief, as far as the hop company, I guess you guys look after the re- like that particular hop region. Is that right? We're buying hops from like three states. Three states specifically. Yeah. Uh, Washington, yeah. Uh, Oregon, and Idaho. Okay. Now, are those three states, and this is for everyone, is that, is that the, like you mentioned, they're the, like they're some of the better? Uh, There's the best hops in the world. Right. I think. So let, let's speak. Let's, let's speak about <laughs> I like agree with you. Yeah. 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 It's true. And we got <coughs> the two of the best uh, hop farmers that's right up. now right. visiting us in Eastern Canada. So it's very no, exciting. It. It's fantastic. And our job here, my job here, is to connect you know all the brewers to hop farmers directly. Okay. So that's because right. usually it was like separate. So right. people, all the farmers were growing hops, but they didn't talk. To the brewers right. and what the brewers wanted and right. what the brewers were expecting from us right and now it's possible mm-hmm. we're making that connection from the growers to the brewers directly so this is the, the fun part right so they know now they know what the brewers want mm-hmm. what they think about the hops what they want from the, the hops and all the products right so this is pretty exciting for all the brewers Right, so yeah, to get that everywhere. personal connection now. This whole weekend is going to be a whole lot of meat greets and right. a yep. whole lot of beer. Right. right, so let's talk about why the um, why is that region so good? Why, like, you know, as you know, beer drinkers out here, I've always been aware of that's the Pacific Northwest is where it's at. I knew of Yakima Valley or Yakima Valley, however you say it. Um, so, yeah, what, what makes this region special? You know, I, I, I'll go back to that whole thing I talked about with the hop plant likes. You know, it's feet wet and it's head dry. That's what you're going to get in the Pacific Northwest and, you know, to a, a great extent in, in South Idaho, Southern Idaho and the Yakima Valley. We've got these dry, hot climates and you get this intense sunlight. You got the long di- daylight length. So, you know, you need to be far enough north so that you get the long days in the summer because uh, a hop plant is very photo period sensitive. That's what triggers when when it initiates the flowering. So it's very, very difficult to grow hops in southern latitudes because the, the daylight lengths are too even throughout the winter and summer. We need that difference in daylight length. So we get that up there. We get the nice, hot, dry uh, climate, the intensity of the sun in the summer because, you know, that's what really any farmer's doing is harvesting sunshine, the energy from the sun, and converting it into to plants. That's what you get in the Acma Valley. And, 
And each one of the three states, and even within Washington State, we have three distinct growing areas. They all have a, just a little bit of difference in them. You know, uh, the Willamette Valley in Oregon would be a little bit cooler and, and receive a little bit more uh, natural precipitation. Well, a lot of them don't irrigate there. Sometimes they don't even have to irrigate, yeah. You know, and, and so right. it gives the, the hop a little bit different profile than you might get from Brock and, and my farm that, you know, comes from a hotter, drier climate. And depending on the brewer and what he wants uh, or he she wants and, and uh, you know, aroma characteristics they're looking for, you're going to come up with different things no matter where you buy your hops. And that's what Loot and, and YCH does is it sources, you know, the right product from the right terroir, the right grower, and gets it to the right yeah. brewer. And right. you alluded to this before. I mean, before when Brock talked about when his dad started growing and, you know, when I started my career, we were growing hops for big major breweries and they call it, it was like a black hole, you know, we put this, it was a commodity. We put it out in the market and all these brewers just really bid for it on a cost basis and a hop was a hop and it disappeared into beer. Right. And now we get it. We get to have communication with each of these growers, and we understand specifically what they want. And we're going to work as hard as we can to get them exactly what they need. Right. So brewers can actually request. Is that what you're sort of suggesting? The brewers say, "Hey, I'm really looking for a hop this profile." Yeah. I mean, they they could yeah. request from which farm or which yeah. region or and what they've liked in really the past. Can, right. And yeah, they can come to you and yeah. make their own selection. Right, so they can come to the actual farm and do the you know the yeah, raw and everything. Yeah. Yep. And actually, just or their headquarters and. Yes, you can do it because you have everything anyway. Yeah. What about, uh, and you sort of sparked an idea, is, is this even a thing? What if a brewer's like, all right, I want a hop that's got this, 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 and this. Oh, yeah. And then is that like one of those hybrid type of things where the, the hops have the numbers and stuff? Well, sometimes brewers will come to us before we've even <laughs> finished the crop. We might be halfway through the growing season, and they, and they may come to us and say, you know, we really like this variety. We, we tend to like it when it's picked on the earlier part of its harvest window. Yep. So if they tell us that, we're going to work as hard as we can to get them that particular product. Or conversely, some, a lot of you know brewers tend to like uh, the hops that are on the later part of their or harvest window, not too late, but because the aroma is more expressive in those. And, and, and so we can target those picking windows for them if we know that ahead of time. And we have those communications now, even before right. we put the hops in a bale. Right. So that's pretty, that's pretty sick though, that there is a, at least that level of customization, but sure. it's not to that like hybrid level of customization that would create well, I mean, like, I think they, that, can, that they make blends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. If, if they come and they want a certain smell out of each variety, mm -hmm. I mean, they can make blends. And then put them like into that. the palettes and stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Interesting. But it couldn't be like, what's the word, like genetically created as such? Well, you know, I mean, then, then I think you're getting, yeah, you're getting into the, the, the design. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, and, and yeah, certain. Awesome. Different. Yeah, yeah, and certain brewers like a certain characteristic, and, and you know, breeding takes a long time. It could take 10 years to, to produce a variety yeah. from an initial thought. But if, if a plant breeder, and we have several of them in the industry, understands what a brewer's looking for, when they're doing their breeding and, and trying to select out promising selections, they can have that in the back of their mind and, and try and breed for that end result. So it's a separate individual, not, not the farmer or such, it's sort of more of a plant like breeder. Sometimes it, it is a farmer. Sometimes yeah. it's oh, a yeah. farmer okay. and sometimes or it's a separate. Like, yeah, I remember a little king. You, you guys have farm. your own breeding program or yeah. YCR. Yeah, we have our own breeding program. It's called Yakima cool. Chief Ranches. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, we had a few growers that like breeding new varieties and coming out every Every year we have, we have a new one. This year is going to be Sabro. Uh, last year was uh, Laurel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, Laurel was for more. Yeah, so every every year there's a new variety. Mm -hmm. but usually it takes at least 10 years mm -hmm. to right. get through the old process. And we're removing a few varieties too. That is, there's some that's not working at all. But there's some that's doing amazing things. And Sabro is, a, is the new one and it's going to be... That's this year or next year? No, it's, it's this year. year. Available the, this year for the first time. Just got named uh, at CBC in Nashville uh, oh, wow. maybe three three months ago. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to be available to brewers everywhere in, uh, in America wow. next year. But it's a pretty amazing hop and it's the there's rumors about being the new Citra. Oh, yeah? So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's a pretty nice hop uh, like coconut and you know, flavors that you don't you know, you, you usually get in you know, regular cups. So no, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. Every year we're coming with a new product. So it's really exciting for, for the growers. Yeah. And but it's really exciting for the brewers too. That's so sick. Um, okay, so those are the, the regions. So one question I mentioned to you guys briefly earlier is, can you break down the, like the, the patent, how do you guys say it? 
Patton. Patton. What Patton. 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 Yeah. <laughs> we have to speak the same language here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How how does that yeah. work in Hot? I know like from I'm from Australia. I know out there they're throwing Galaxy and all mm-hmm. their beers like it's nothing. But I know that the brewers out here, it's expensive to get it. It's mm-hmm. it's hard to get hold of, and um, you guys can't grow it, and, and they people out here can't grow it. So how does that sort of you know how do you you patent a living organism? How does yeah. that sort of work? So you got to got to think back to <clears throat> what Luke was talking about earlier and how long it takes to breed a hop. And you talked about ten years, and sometimes it takes even longer to get yeah. it clear through the process of you know they a brewer might make a uh, thousand crosses or more a year, maybe five thousand crosses a year, and get maybe ten promising varieties out of that. And out of those ten maybe eight of them have terrible agronomic properties and the heart, you can't grow them. So then you're down to two. And then out of the two, eventually maybe one's not, a brewers don't like it. Yeah, and so so you, you could start with 5,000 to get down to one, right? And think about how many years it takes to get through this process. Well, somebody's gotta do the work to, 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 to do that. And as an industry, initially we were struggling with how that, how do you compensate that person for the 10 years of work and blood, sweat and tears that it took to get this variety? Right. We were doing that and we still do through our university system and you know public research. Um, but it's maybe not as efficient as some of the private programs where you have a specific person doing this work that needs to get compensated sometime. That's, what they That's do. right. Yeah. So when they get out of these 5,000, they get one that gets makes it way, its way to market, like a Citra, for instance. That person needs to be compensated for their time, and patenting it and the royalties that might come from that are a way for that person to be compensated. Mm-hmm. And when you provide a program that rewards that breeder for, for doing that and rewards the grower for, for growing it, guess what? That breeder wants to breed more new varieties and they, and they introduce even more options for brewers in the future. So sometimes I think brewers can view that whole process negatively, but they really need to think long term about it and how do you compensate that person for coming up with new varieties that are going to be exciting for those brewers as, as they move forward. They really want that, which I know a lot of them do. Yeah. Think about it long term, you know, and, and we have to compensate that person, and that's where the, that's the royalties where and the, the patents come from. That's my view on it anyway. Right. Plus, I think on the patent, it, it kind of holds the market so they can control that variety. So I guess it can't just go into the marketplace and every farmer can plant it and then kill that market. So it kind of helps the hop industry having these pants, patented varieties out there so they can control the quantities and control what people are using it and you know how it's used properly match supply and demand and i think that helps a lot with where the industry's at now Mm -hmm. i mean you got the public varieties you got all the patented varieties and i think it's going to maintain the market having these patented varieties out there okay what uh this might be a ridiculous question can you briefly list some of the key public ones and some of the key private varieties or patented Varieties. So I'd say the key public would be Chinook, Cascade, um, Willamette, Willamette, yeah. Zeus, Galena. It's all, Galena. It's all very easy that have been being raised or clustered. In Quebec clusters. But, but these have all come from public breeding programs back in the 70s, 80s, and 60s. Long time ago. Yeah. 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 USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, Oregon yeah. Department of Agriculture, or WSU. Oregon State, that's where those varieties came from. from right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the private ones, so yeah, like, I guess, like, they said Citra, 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 Amarillo, Amarillo, uh, Apollo, Bravo, Palisade, Equinox, Equinox, Lemon Drop, okay. Denali, Sabro, Sabro. Sabro. Okay. Yeah. So everything. Mm-hmm. Pretty much the main ones so, in the marketplace yeah, today yeah. are patented The most varieties. popular ones are I know, right now yeah. are. So then, which ones were natural? Like, which ones were created in the lab of sorts? They're all created naturally. So the way hop breeding works is in, in a production production situation, we only grow free male plants. They produce the flower that becomes the hop, right? The male plants that pollinate those, we don't want those in our fields because they will uh, make the female plant, the cone, produce seeds, which have tannins and are negative to the brewing process. But so in like the marijuana, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're related. Yeah. 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 So, but in the breeding program, uh, breeders maintain, you know, sets of, of female plants and male plants. And they introduce the pollen from the male plant to the female plant. 
Okay, it produces a, a cone that that has seeds. Then you can take that seed and plant it and produce a different variety. So that's how it's done. And it but could that be takes, a male or a female. Or right. A, yeah. Or a, Exactly. So you grow that seed and it pops up and it's a male. Well, that's great for breeding because you've got a new male to breed with, but it doesn't give you anything that you can make beer with. Right, so, gotcha. some, so some of the selections get knocked out because they they come up as males instead of females. Yeah, right. but it's or they all, might not have anything on them. Yeah, it's all a natural process. We don't we don't have the GMO thing at this point in time, at least my knowledge so in the hop industry. So there is no there was so there was no like original hop or whatever, like for lack of a better term. I mean, there had to. I think there, there had to have been sure, something. Sure. Right? Yeah, there was an original hop somewhere sometime. Maybe you got to ask Adam and Eve that. You know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, but, but I think it'll kind of do it on its own too. Sometimes exactly. it'll change. Field. you'll have that every once in a while right and so i think it had some seeds and then that and right that, and all of a sudden you got all these different hops now and then it just kind of happened and that's a big thing right now too is people scouring the countryside. you know they tend to grow on ditch banks of rivers and things like that yeah, where they're wild you know a, right. a male hop introduced pollen in, into a female that was grown in the wild and, and a new variety uh, was produced as a result it's no maybe no one's even harvested the hops off of it because it's just been growing on the banks of a river yeah. and people go out and, and look for those unique new varieties and uh, that try and put them else. into commercial production or breed with them too that's cool eh? yeah that's it's really no neat. guys i really appreciate it this is fascinating thank you really very much thanks for to you time. yeah thanks for really having us pretty good where can uh everybody who's listening or watching where can they all find you guys online Where's uh, Yakima? Yakimachieve.com. Yakimachieve.com. Uh, brand new site. It's not like really accurate for now, but there's a lot of new stuff coming out, and I'm gonna be there. You can reach me there. Okay. They need uh, any question about hops. Need to know about pricing, varieties. Drop me a line. I'm there. Legend. Thank you. Like yeah, and for us, you know, we've got doublerhop.com, and you know, it's a it's a great overview of our family farm and things. But to be honest with you, we more concentrate on Facebook and Instagram now because that's where you're going to get the daily updates. Oh, that's loud! Fantastic. Yeah, perfect. Yep, and then we're at obendorfhop.com and also on Facebook. So Obendorf Farms, Obendorf Hop, we're the only Obendorfs out there. So, so there look is. for that. <laughs> so. Amazing. Yeah, guys, thank you so much. Thanks for once again. Thanks for having us. Really yep. appreciate it. Thank yep. you so you much. Um, guys, if you enjoyed the episode, mate, check us a big fat thumbs up. Hit subscribe below and hit the notification. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and hit the notification bell. Ding. So you know when the new videos drop. Follow us on social media at BOS Podcast. And check out the long form audio uh, here on iTunes so you can see and listen to some very attractive gentlemen like these guys right here. Talk yes. about hops and beer. <laughs> and uh, of course on Spotify now, follow, rate, subscribe, review, all that nonsense. That is it, guys. Thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you in the next one. Get it in you. Cheers. Peace. Cheers. <laughs>